In my last video, I went and visited an Anglican church in Overland Park, Kansas. It's a part of the Anglican Church in North America, ACNA. And there's a gentleman there named Pastor Patrick Wildman who was kind enough to show me around. He was awesome. Uh, the church is beautiful. I learned a ton of stuff. If you haven't seen that video, you might want to go check it out. But as he was showing me around, I felt like this is a guy I could sit down with and ask some basic but difficult questions of, and I don't think he would be threatened by it. And so I asked him at the end of our tour if he could extend a little bit with me, if we could sit down and if I could ask him about the background of their expression of Christianity, their theology, a few more details about some of the hot button issues, and also some personal questions that I have wrestled with over the ages about faith and that I know a lot of you have wrestled with as well because I hear from you. And he was up for it. And so the video you're about to watch is that follow-up sit-down interview with Pastor Patrick Wildman of Christ Church Anglican in Overland Park, Kansas. This gets to some really honest places, and I found it really meaningful, and I hope you do as well. All right, here we go. Is there a specific name to this brand of Anglicanism that is practiced here, or is it all just Anglicanism? Well, Anglicanism is if you think of it as an umbrella, it's a big, it's a large umbrella. There's a lot underneath it. And so this church in particular uh, was founded by people who were interested in really creating more of a lower church expression of Anglicanism, a more Protestant evangelical expression of Anglicanism. I would describe that as uh, characterized by people like John Stott. And, okay. You know, so, so, but there is a much more higher church expression of Anglicanism, a more Anglo-Catholic expression. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues who are in that camp, and I love them, you know, but just slightly different, you know, and more formal, and, and obviously some theological differences and that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's, it's a big tent. Is there institutional distinctions or is that big tent one institution and a lot of different manifestations occur under it well our our denomination the the anglican church in north america a c n a yeah okay so you know we're we're all a part of the same same thing but you know different dioceses so so within that that church there are dioceses a bishop oversees a diocese and so those different dioceses tend to reflect obviously the the theology of the bishop right and so they they tend to take on those characteristics so if the bishop is a more high church anglo-catholic bishop then typically the churches are too what would be the super agreed upon you go to more or less any Anglican church theological distinctive. You just, we all think this, what would that be? Well, there, there are really, um, you know, all Anglicans, and, and this, this has been a consistent debate, I mean, for a long time, like what unites Anglicans? Because the Anglican church is all over the world, and so everywhere, you know, if you go to Uganda or Rwanda or, wherever, you know, the, the church starts to take on different characteristics depending upon wherever it is, you know, so. Because culture is a thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, the Bible as the inspired word of God, you know, um, the creeds as a sufficient statement of faith, uh, bishops, you know, all Anglican churches are, um, governed by bishops, uh, the dominical sacraments, the sacraments of Jesus, holy communion and bap holy baptism. You know, those, those would be things that would be agreed upon by all, all Anglicans. Where do Anglicans have some degree of debate in terms of style and theology? Anglicans have different, you know, uh, views on a lot of different things. Um, you know, uh, there are more practical debates about how strictly do you need to follow all the rubrics of the prayer book and worship and that kind of thing. 
you know, but there's bigger picture debates about things like, um, you know, women's ordination, you know, women being ordained to the priesthood. Like here at Christchurch, we've had women priests since, well, long before I came, but probably in the mid to late 70s. I was talking with Trish out here. Is she ordained? She is. She's she awesome. Is. Yeah. What's her role here? She's the executive pastor. Okay. And so she serves some on Sundays and, you know, but she's, I've been here 22 years and she's been here 20. She attended here before that, but she's been on staff for 20 years. So uh, she does a lot of different things, but yeah, she's, we have, uh, we've had a, we've had women priests here, yeah, since at least the mid seventies, but that's a pretty contentious debate um, in our world. And I, I have a lot of colleagues who vehemently disagree with me about it, but I don't, you know, those things are not personal. Um, sure. They're, they're not, uh, we, we, we agree to live together and love one another despite those kind of differences. What are, the, what are the theological undergirdings of that discussion? Because I've certainly visited churches and talked with folks who'd be like, oh, like, of course you got to ordain women. I'm like, oh, okay, well, walk me through that theologically. And their answer is, well, the, the New Testament, like it was kind of just back then. And, and so, I, you know, and, and some of that stuff, like you just got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. And it's, and it's really a pretty weak defense that, mm -hmm that ultimately kind of, in my estimation, sort of sells out <laughs> a whole lot of other things in yeah. an attempt to, uh, to, to justify that particular practice. Then I've had other friends who would come from traditions where women's ordination is a thing, and they've got a little more nuanced perspective that seems to maintain that other value you just mentioned in terms of like, the authority of scripture what is what is the rationale here and and how, how does that work what does the discussion look like i mean certainly and i'm going to try to answer the way our bishop uh, todd hunter answers this question so you know you ha you can you have scholars on both ends of the spectrum on this debate that go through you know the new testament with a fine tooth comb and and you know dig into every word headship and all, all those kinds of things. I'm probably not going to add a lot to that conversation. Um, you know, so, and, and they come to different conclusions, you know, uh, whether they're on the complementarian side or the egalitarian side, you know. It, I love though the way Bishop Todd talks about it. He talks about it as an issue, also an issue not just of, um, uh, what specifically the Bible says about these specific things, and I'm probably saying that wrong, but it's really a kingdom issue. So like when Paul talks about in the kingdom, there is no male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We're all one. And if the kingdom is not only something in the future, but is now, so we're trying to live now what will someday be mm -hmm. when those divisions, those hierarchies will cease. Hmm. I've visited churches where just out of habit, I use language like you just did. Kingdom this, kingdom that. Well, okay, so these are kingdom values because I see that. I've, I've, Spent a bunch of time in the book of Matthew lately, yeah. trying to understand it and working on it. Yeah. And that theme comes up a lot. Obviously, it's a payoff on the Old Testament theme of this eternal throne promised to David's descendants. Somebody's going to sit on it. I mean, it's there. It's yeah, real. Yeah. But I've run into some folks who really balk at that language. So it seems like it's a centerpiece here. Like, you were talking about kingdom out here, you're talking about kingdom sitting here. What does that mean in simple language for the outsider? A kingdom is a, is a sphere, a place, a territory where the will of the king is done. 
And so the kingdom is anywhere that God's will is done, where his rule and reign are made manifest. So is everything the kingdom, since God is sovereign over creation, unlimited in his power? Uh, no, everything is not the kingdom. There is, a, there is, you know, the Bible speaks to this. There's the kingdom of this world that is not part of God's kingdom. Now, someday it will be. Someday he will reign forever and ever. And the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? So, so, but right now, those kingdoms are not one. They are kind of at odds with one another. So you are going for an expression of the kingdom here that is representative of what it is and what it will be. Our, our bishop talks about that often like he, he describes churches as outposts of the kingdom. So what are the values there? And what, is that, what does that look like in terms of the lived experience of a person who's participating in kingdom life in this church? Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 it means that it's more, this is more than something that is just kind of in our heads. It's more than just, hey, we kind of check some boxes of intellectual tenets of faith, but it's, it's lived out. It's, it's, it's in our everyday lives. You know, so it's embodied. I don't know if that's making any sense. I think it is. Lots of people have, um, values, stuff that they're into, they go through life, maybe apart from God, apart from church. Yeah. But I mean, everybody in their mind has some sort of moral compass, whether sure. I might totally agree with how that moral compass is dialed or not. Right. Well, that's another conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but everybody has guiding principles sure. and then those guiding principles play themselves out. How is what happens here different than any normal set of guiding principles somebody might land on for how to navigate life and relationships? Well, here we're, I mean, we are unapologetically, you know, we're trying to live by the values of Jesus and, and his kingdom. Absolutely. So it's outside um, in. This is not a self-actualized set of values. Right. These, yeah. are, these are values handed down to you. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, those values are very much, I think, in contrast to the values of the kingdom of this world. In what ways? Well, I mean, honestly, right now in our culture uh, that I experience, it feels to me like the overarching value is just be yourself. You do you, whatever that means. Sure. And that's just, that seems to be kind of the highest value of, of culture right now. Just, well, not whatever that means. I mean, there are a few yeah. things that culture yeah. frowns upon that you're not allowed to be. A few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, we, we are unapologetic about the fact that we are focused on Jesus and we want to embody and live out the val his values, the values of his kingdom. You know, so we want to be uh, a forgiving people. We want to. But be that intones that people have problems, which is in conflict with the you do you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, 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 part of the values of the kingdom, in this context, then, is inclusive of the assumption that people are flawed and have sin. Absolutely. That's not a scary word here. No, they, people hear it every Sunday. Really? Absolutely. Both in the message and in the liturgy, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How is that glory restored? Through Jesus Christ. 
coming to faith in him and following in his ways, being transformed by the Holy Spirit so that we become more and more like him, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. And we're transformed from glory to glory. Um, and as we are transformed, I think we're able to experience more and more of that life that he has for us. We come fully alive. I think, I think you're on to something in that that is profoundly in contrast with the values of planet Earth right now. It, a story that oh. starts with the assumption there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Like that, the only thing that you no, can't do... No, that doesn't do preach. Is, yeah, <laughs> that there, doesn't preach today. No, it doesn't. It, it but doesn't, we do. But it but squares with my experience. It, I know there's something wrong with me. Totally. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how many Disney Plus shows tell me there's nothing wrong with me, though they may be very entertaining. Yeah. I, I still know. And, and for my journey yeah. of faith, that was a huge part of what I couldn't square and why I was unable to make the leap to a yeah. there's nothing wrong with me faith. I, I just can't go there. I can understand right. it and I can listen. But look, there are redemptive things about me. And there's stuff that through the influence of other people and, and the influence of, of God and his presence, I, I hope, in my life. Yeah. that I've seen that are less screwed up and less weird than they used to be, even beautiful things, redemptive things mm -hmm. starting to peek out every now and then in my life. But mm -hmm. I, I know my mind. I know, mm -hmm. I, I know the snap impulse I have when I'm encountered with any situation. And it, it starts with me and what I want, what I get, and how this affects me. And then some other thing has to challenge that very intentionally to think about other values and other people and other things, I know there's something wrong with me is yeah. the point. And as much as I find the message of the world appealing, it doesn't square with my honest reality no. of self. No. So. And we're, we're not, you know, we're not here. We're not trying to make nice people nicer. What are you trying to do? We're trying to lead people to Jesus Christ. We're, we're trying to bring glory to God by helping people to come to faith in Jesus Christ and have their lives transformed. And we believe that that's, that's what we were created for. We were created to be in that kind of a relationship with God that is made possible through Jesus and his death and resurrection. We, I mean, we, we really believe this stuff. I, but I notice that your language is not like come to our church where everyone is bad and we reflect on that badness. Your language is all forward looking, proactive, yeah. life abundantly, life in the kingdom. And so it, I guess what I'm hearing is there's no real reason for the proactive invite if there isn't a problem in the first place. Right. But through the acknowledgement of the problem in the first place, it makes the thing that you're inviting people to, that Christ is inviting people to, much right. more compelling because it, it's, a, I mean, it's a new nature. It's an other thing. It's an other set of values. Right. Well, and, and you know, one of the things that I love about the fact that we um, celebrate communion, mm -hmm. Eucharist, every Sunday is it, it keeps the gospel central. So no matter what we may be preaching on, you know, and we typically do exegetical sermons, they tend to be fairly gospel oriented in, in nature. But even if we were preaching on, um, you know, doing a series on family or something like that, you know, you're still gonna hear a clear message of the gospel every Sunday. Give me the bullet point version of that. What is the gospel? Well, there, there, you know, like I said, we run the Alpha course, and I think that that really is a presentation of the gospel, but it's 10 weeks, you know. It's, it's, there, there's a lot of facets to the gospel, but the core of the gospel, you know, the thing that Paul says, the thing is of, 
utmost importance I, I give to you, you know, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. On the third day, he was raised to life. You know, so the, the core of the gospel is that we were created by God, we were good, but we've rebelled, we've turned away from him. But through Jesus and his death and resurrection, uh, we've been given a gift. Here it is. The gift of, of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, uh, the gift of being restored into relationship with God. We're given that free gift that we receive by faith. Is that gift offered to everyone, automatically given to everyone, like that U2 album was when people bought iPods? It's not automatically given, because, it, I mean, the gift is available, but it has to be received. You could, you could say, Patrick, I have a free gift for you, and I could refuse to receive it. And unfortunately, people do. So how do they receive it in Anglicanism? In your tradition, what does it look like for a person to be like, that sounds great, I want in? Well, certainly faith is, is, is critical there. You, you, know, you receive it by faith. Um, and then, of course, we would definitely say, you know, if you have faith in Christ, then we want you to be baptized. You know, so we'd be baptized, initiated into the life of the church. What about somebody who wants to have faith, wants to believe it, thinks it makes rational sense, wants it to be true, wishes it was true, but at some deep level of their essence feels like it's too big a leap, and, and though they want it, they can't, the heart level, feel it 100% at their essence. What do you do with them? If somebody came to me and said, oh, Patrick, I really want this to be true, but I don't think it is, then I would say, well, let's, let's keep working at it. Okay. <laughs> let's keep working until you get there. So you can't just baptize that person no. and call it, no. call it good? No, because it's meaningless. Without faith, the, the, the sacraments have to be received in faith. Or else, you know, I can come forward, receive communion. Uh, but if I don't actually have faith in Christ, like I said, like we really believe this stuff. Like if I don't really have faith in Christ, then it means nothing to me. So the, the, the benefits that would be communicated by coming and receiving the blessed bread and wine, they don't come to us unless we come in faith. You know, just having water sprinkled on my head or, or dunked in the water, we do, we do both kinds of baptisms here, okay. uh, immersion and sprinkling, but... Um, you know, it's just the removal of dirt from the skin. Hmm. Like it was saying, Peter, you know, if, if there's no faith. So what do you do with doubt in your tradition? Like, what if somebody on the front end of it is like, uh, I believe most of the time and the other times I want to. Or what if somebody's been in it for a long time and maybe something happens or maybe nothing happens. Yeah. And maybe it's the fact that nothing happens that gets them to a place where they're like, yeah, I think it's probably all true, but I don't know. I like never saw a miracle or anything, and mm -hmm. it's compelling, and I'm here, but I just feel a little bit dead inside, and sometimes I doubt. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Um, you know, we, we talk about doubt as if we just assume Everyone has doubts. Everyone, um, and we go through seasons of life where we have, our doubts are greater maybe than in other seasons. But we can still stay true to Jesus in our doubts. Okay, I think I'm understanding. Our, our doubts don't, don't mean that we have to just abandon 
our faith. No. I mean, we can still stay true to Jesus in our doubts. I mean, it says in Matthew 28, you know, the 11. So imagine this. The 11 gather with the risen Jesus. And it says they worshiped him, but some doubted. And, and he had been dead recently. Yeah. And now he's eating with them. So yeah, how about if, that? If, if they doubted, well, then I think we're going to doubt too. Yeah, and I do. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm, most of what I'm asking is, is hypothetical because I think the honest person watching this, maybe they've watched some of the conversations we've had like this in Catholic contexts, um, Pentecostal contexts, an Orthodox context. Um, a more evangelical context, they, they hear it, and maybe the high church stuff, they're like, all right, I understand the steps. You enter the church through baptism at the back, mm -hmm. and you live the church in the nave, and up here you, you celebrate communion and buried in the churchyard. I get the journey of faith. The church does the heavy lifting. I don't mean that as a pejorative or a critique of Catholicism. No, that's not true. Yes, I do. I don't think that theologically. So, yes, I... Yeah, I, I do find that theology to be unsatisfactory on that level because I do see in the Bible a, a very personal element to the relationship and I don't see the church as being that mm -hmm. mediator role. Yeah. I think, I believe in the priesthood of all believers and I think we have access to yeah. the thrones. That's why I'm not Catholic. It's the biggest reason. Yeah. But I get how somebody could watch this video and be like, I get it with Catholicism. You yeah. sign up. Your parents make a decision for you in some cases. You're baptized. My Catholic friends have told me salvation occurs at that point. Other Catholic <clears throat> friends have nuanced it a little bit differently. But the yeah. mechanics are very clear <coughs> Excuse me. if you find that satisfying. Sacraments, God's grace, it is administered to you through mm -hmm. them by someone who's approved by the hierarchy. It's very right. historical. I could see how someone from an apostolic sign right. gift tradition, which I'm also not a part of, or somebody watching a video with that crowd yeah. can say, oh, I get it. So if something happens and you get your miracle or you have that feeling or yeah. you can suddenly speak a language that isn't a normal language, but somehow it's from God, yeah. it could be. Do I find that compelling myself? I do not, but it's, it's measurable. There's a thing like, ah, yeah, external expression. I can see it. That's the system. I get yeah. it, I know I'm in. If, if someone comes to a tradition like mine or like yours, where there's quite a bit of shaded area that I'm detecting yeah. between the two, I could see yeah. how they would say, of all the different systems I've seen, this is the trickiest one because it seems like belief is a really key pivot point in this. Yeah. And that's, that's one, it's hard to measure. And two, feels like my belief in everything fluctuates over the course of my life. Is there some kind of cutoff? How do I know that I'm in? Like what happens if something goes wrong and like I super did believe and I super am going to believe later, but right now I just feel kind of dead inside. Like, like mm -hmm. how does that mechanism work? And so that's why I'm, mm -hmm. that's why I'm picking yeah. your brain. It's not to like put yeah. you on the spot and get you to yeah. like, say something to pass some kind of well, test. Our faith, I'm asking because I care. Our faith is not based upon our feelings in any given moment. What is it based upon? Why, why, at the it's basic based level, upon what's Jesus the hope? And, and what he has done for us. Not, not the varied ups and downs of our lives. Um, so our, our faith ultimately is in him and not, you know, it's not determined just simply by how I feel in any given day. But we need to believe to be saved. Yes. But it's a belief that transcends feelings? Yes. What does that look like? It looks like... Uh, I... I I love my wife, and I'm married to my wife for 31 years. Do every day I just have these unbelievable feelings? And no, it ebbs and flows, and 
Uh, you're married. You know. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Some days, some days we're mad I at each other. I have no idea what he's talking about, honey. This man sounds crazy to me on this point. Continue. Yeah. So, but but our commitment to one another. It's it's a covenant relationship. Yeah. Sure. And in a, in a similar way, I think that's what our relationship with God is like. It's a covenant. It's, um, it's much deeper and more substantial than just our feelings in a, in a given moment. A covenant, and, and that's, I recognize that language from the New Testament. I recognize it from mm -hmm. the institution of the it's Lord's a new, Supper yeah, it's a new in Matthew covenant 26. In His blood, yeah. right? So it's not, 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 it's not first and foremost about me and how I'm feeling. So it's not, when you do this in remembrance me, this is the, the new covenant in your steadiness of conviction. <laughs> right. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. I mean, I, hmm. Okay. So I always, I always use this expression, the heavy lifting. Who is doing it here in the understanding of faith that you have within Anglicanism? I mean, Christ, the church, the individual belief, theology, what does the big lift that solves the human problem here? What is the big lift that solves the human problem here? That's a big question. But it's, it's not the church, except that the church is the vehicle through which Jesus is working. It's his church. So ultimately, everything comes back to him. I mean, he's the one doing the heavy lifting. And the cross is where the lift happens? The cross is certainly a pivotal moment in that lifting, but it's not as if he, he stopped working. Okay. He's still working. He's still shaping us, transforming us through the power of the Spirit so that his, his presence, his power in our lives continues. Uh, certainly, the cross is central to what we believe, because we believe that, you know, actually something, that he actually did die, and something actually took place there. You know, it's not just some metaphor, or, you know, uh, something, but it's, something actually concrete took place there. So it, it's, it's absolutely central to who we are and what we believe. But it's not as if um, that's the whole story. There's a resurrection, right? So, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole thing's ridiculous if there isn't. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Without a resurrection, there's no... The resurrection is what tells us that the cross has, has meaning. Yeah, if that's... I'm with you, even in my darkest days of wobbling or even broken yeah. faith, still, it's a pretty logical equation. If Christ is not raised from the dead, the thing is a joke. Yeah. If that, as ridiculous as that proposition sounds, as people who live in a physical world or are used to certain physical rules, that's still the calling of the shot that was made. Either that's going to happen and it's all true, or it's not going to happen and why cling to any of it? Right. And so I, I don't feel a lot of resonance with those fringe Christian expressions where they're like, well, you know, Jesus was interesting. And early Christians believed in a way in their heart, they felt a metaphor for him being alive with them in the same way we remember the people who meant so much to us. And, I, that just is the least compelling thing ever. Yeah. It sounds like a bunch of rubes lied to themselves to make them feel better about the sunk cost they already had in the Jesus thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, at that point, like, come yeah. on, be a social action club, just call it what it is. But I find tremendous resonance with other Christians, even if they do a lot of stuff different than me, if they yeah. view that as the pivot point. If there is a guy who said, 
or affirmed that people said about him that he is God in the flesh, the Christ, the long-promised Messiah, the Son of God. And if there was a guy who did all the things that Jesus did and basically pushed all of his chips to the middle and was like, you'll see, standing at the right hand of the Father, I, I, alive in three days, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And then that actually happened. That's the most compelling thing in the history of humankind. Without a doubt. And I can't shake it. Without a doubt. Yeah. And, and we absolutely affirm that, hmm. believe that, and we preach it every Sunday. Um, again, unapologetically. And you say there's more. Though that it's not the cross, it's not just the resurrection. That Christ's function goes beyond that. That there's more in the life of the person who responds to it, and I think that takes us all the way back to the values of the kingdom and the stuff we were talking right. about at the beginning. The the very proactive orientation of everything in here, the windows, the orientation of what you've done to cultivate things outside, the mix of the old and the new, the the logo, the the statement of purpose that you have right under it. All of that points to something that looks beyond that moment of yeah. belief. And how does the cross and the resurrection, how does that manifest in the life of the person who responds to it? What does it, what does it look like to be that kind of Christian? Mm -hmm. you know, we're preaching in Hebrews right now. And so my text um, that I'm working on for this coming Sunday is Hebrews 12. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And so I think always we're encouraging people to uh, look to Jesus, to keep their eyes fixed on him, um, and to be inspired by not only what he has done for us, but where he's taking us. You know, so we're, we're people who are kind of simultaneously looking back and giving thanks for what he has done for us, but also looking forward to the fullness of salvation that will someday be ours. You know, so I think we want people, they have to be rooted in Christ and his death and resurrection. At the same time, we have to point people forward to, well, yeah, what does this mean for my life? And how do I live out this uh, faith in my life? You know, how am I, how am I living into the death of Jesus. I've not heard that phrase turned quite that way before. I gotta think about that for a minute. Okay. The way of the cross. Okay. You know, how am I carrying my cross? You know, which is not like, oh, I have a bad back, or it's just my cross to bear. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how am I giving up myself? How am I giving up my life for the sake of others? To go and redeem problems that aren't your problem the same way Christ went yeah, and redeemed a problem absolutely. that wasn't his problem. So, so the cross informs not just, it's not just for our own forgiveness, but it informs our whole way of life. Okay, so I'm hearing you talk about two things with the cross, and then one is that there is actually some kind of atonement, to use the Bible word. It did a thing right. that addressed the problem we were talking about earlier. But then beyond that, it also, not in opposition to, but also is setting the trajectory. I mean, it's, it's the example of the king of the kingdom that he went and did that, as the king, I mean, that's a pretty humble gesture yeah. to go and be yeah. put down by your underlings and your <laughs> right. subjects when right. you could stop them and you don't stop yeah. them for their own benefit, for their sake, for the glory of your father. So, 
So sometimes I, I talk with people and I sense that it's atonement theology or it's moral example right. theology. What I'm hearing is kind of both. One does the salvation thing, the other informs the what does the Christian life look like following the example of Christ thing. Am I following you right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that speaks back into doubt a little bit too, because if that if that transaction of God's love and His justice that's resolved at the cross is something that we don't own, and then like we didn't do it, I didn't die on the cross, right? And I'm not qualified to. I mean, I suppose I could. I don't want anybody to try. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm, I'm qualified to physically die on a cross. I'm not qualified to right. accomplish what Jesus accomplished on right. the cross. So that's about God. That's about something he did. But then that happens beyond my power. I believe I wobble. I believe I wobble. I have questions about this. You go through dark places. But even as you go through that, the story still stands. The moral example, the, the trajectory example, the lead by example of Jesus is there, whether you're in a place of just maximum mile high, this is the clearest it's ever been faith or this isn't going very well right now, struggle. Right. Yeah, that does kind of help, that does kind of help it address or ameliorate some of the pressures to really make sure I keep my belief quotient at, right at that high level yeah. or lie to everybody if it isn't at that really yeah. high level. Yeah, belief is not, in, belief in the Bible is not intellectual assent or simply intellectual assent. It's trust. It's, it's confident trust. So when Jesus says, believe in me, he's not simply, he doesn't simply mean, oh, can you, do you intellectually check a box that says, yes, I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again on the third day. Yeah, I check all those boxes intellectually. I, I believe that. It's, it's more of a, a trust confident trust so it's like placing our lives in in his hands so the intellectual side of believing yeah is going to have some ebbs and flows we're going to have some challenges that uh and and you know some people are just wired up differently and so some people that are really intellectually wired up they have more intellectual challenges in, in believing. Sure. Sometimes people just have doubts when they go through hard things. You know, it's sure. like, like the, the, the Hebrew Christians that were receiving the, the letter. You know, yes. they, they were being persecuted. They were having struggles. Some of them were, some of them were abandoning ship. They were giving up. Yeah, or me. When I do something stupid yeah. or somebody does something stupid to me. Yeah. Like I'll wobble. That, yeah. That's when it hurts. Yeah. Um, or when I get so far down the mind rabbit hole that I get to an intellectual math problem that I just have to live in tension with for a while. Yeah. Usually that doesn't eat my lunch, but you know, yeah. it sits there in the back yeah. of the brain. So I don't, I mean, I can have days where I have intellectual challenges and, and, and experience those doubts, but I've never had a day not not one since i came to faith in christ and you know his grace kind of reached out and grabbed me there's never been a day that i said yeah i'm i'm out hmm. i'm done hmm. that that confident trust in him has not wavered i've never said yeah you know i kind of you kind of took me in and I'm, I'm saying, no, I, 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 I'm out. There's never been a day that I thought that, even in my darkest days of doubt. Hmm. What role does the, the table, what role does communion play in your tradition in salvation and in continuity of faith? Well, depending, you know, Anglicanism is a big tent, and so you're going to get different 
answers to that. But what is core, and it is every Sunday, you know, I am, I am having to grapple with the gospel, the good news, the, 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 I'm having to grapple with my own sin that kind of made it necessary for Jesus to go to the cross. So there's this, there's this moment where not only am I having to do a lot of introspection and confession, uh, which is built in to our services, but you know, all leading up to communion, but I'm being rooted continually in that story. This is who I am. This is what I needed, and Jesus did it for me. So it keeps me rooted in that story, but not only that, it, it's, it's a sacrament. So it's a, a way that we receive grace. And not just grace like so that we go to heaven when we die, but grace like the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection are communicated to me in that moment. When I come and receive by faith the body and blood of Jesus, you know, it's like that, it's like that's, that story is made new to me every Sunday. So this would be... It's like he did this and he did it for me. Sustenance as opposed to birth and continual rebirth. It, the, I'm not becoming a Christian again every no. time no, no, no. that I go to the table. It's, it's, yeah, it's like a sus sustenance is a good way to describe it. Okay. So, so if I'm you not know, here for a chunk of time, I'm still a Christian... That, that that is by every merit, time so. you do this, right? Remember me. Well, what were they doing? I mean, that that was a Passover meal, but they were they were having bread and wine. How often did they have bread and wine? It was a staple. Yeah, yeah. Every time you do this, remember me. Hmm. We forget. We're forgetful people. And, you know, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Why did he keep saying that? Well, because they, for, they forgot, right? Not that they literally forgot, but, you know, we... Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. <laughs> prone to leave the God I love. Yes. You know, so... I, can, I sing that line hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so... So... Communion... It's all, it's sustaining. It's always bringing me back, bringing, hmm. keeping me rooted hmm. in what is the absolute essential of our story. Hmm. Who Jesus is and what he has done for us. But in that moment, it's what he has done for me. As Paul, you know, writes, he loved me and gave himself for me. When I come to the table, it's he gave himself for me. And that's powerful. That, that makes mountains of sense. Look, obviously I went to school for this. Like I, yeah. I've read the books you've read. I've, yeah. I've read the Bible you've read. I've done the job you do, not as long or as well yeah. as you've done it, but I think about this a lot. You think about this a lot. It's been very valuable to not just pester you with questions so I can make an internet video, but I, I don't know, you're probably reading me right. No, I just decided I was going to take this time sitting with you and I actually kind of run through it for myself. Again, like, okay, why do I think this? And how does that work? And what about when it's like this? And just 
to hear somebody else who I've never met, who's been through their own journey with all of this, put their words to it and articulate it. And it's been really helpful mm -hmm. and, and clarifying. And I'm appreciative of all of it. What if somebody else has been sitting in on this conversation with us and they've been fascinated by church, religion, theology, philosophy, all the stuff mm -hmm. that people talk about on the yeah. internet that we talk about here. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. That is actionable. What do they, what would, should they do? Well, if they're in Kansas city, they should come see me. I think that makes perfect. <laughs> is that an invite? Yes. Seriously? Yes. So you won't be weirded out if somebody shows up and no. they're like, I'm from the internet. I want to talk more about the thing. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. What if they're not in Kansas city? Uh, then I would encourage them to try to find an alpha course. Hmm. See if there's an alpha course anywhere, a church that runs alpha, because that's who, we, that's who we want to attend our alpha course. People, by definition, they're seeking, right? If they come to alpha. So um, that's a, an amazing way to be able to kind of, like I said, process and ask your questions. And, but what I would say to anybody who's having that thought, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not random. It's not just your head talking to you. I would say that's, that's God trying to get your attention. And so take some action on that. You know, find a church, find somebody that you can, that you can talk to. If you want, you can, you can call me or email me. I don't care. Uh, I love to talk to people about and help them find their way to Christ. Awesome. This has been a delight. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very meaningful interview with me, and I really appreciated the way Pastor Patrick could have just given me clinical answers about the nuts and bolts of his tradition and his local church. But you could see it a couple times in there that he paused and he looked at me and he reckoned me and he determined, yeah, I think this guy's actually asking. I think he sincerely wants to know what I think about this deeper question of faith and what it looks like to live that out what my understanding of that is. And I could tell that then he made a decision after a pause to say, I'm going to actually answer him and, and actually answer you. And I thought that was really cool. That stood out to me from this conversation, the, the style, the approach, the tone that he took. It was smart. It was pastoral. It was an important afternoon for me in, in my own process of faith. And I'm really grateful to Patrick and to Christ Church, obviously for letting me show up, letting me bring a camera, trusting me. It's such a risk, such a brave move to say, uh, we might get taken advantage of here. This is some unknown quantity from the internet that we're taking this beautiful, precious thing and putting it in front of. I hope he treats us fairly and well, but hey, we got to do things. We, we have to give this away. We have to communicate it. We're going to take the risk. I mean, that's the calculation they're running. And so I respect them for that. I respect them for the way they handled their business. And I respect them for their answers. I really resonated with a lot of what's going on at this church. And I want to think that through with you over a longer period of time. But this was a lot to take in. It's a big conversation, uh, a long interview. So I'm going to let you think about it. I'm going to think about it. And then we'll get together again, probably in the next video that I publish on this channel. And uh, we'll game out a little bit what this particular slice of historical Christianity, this little branch on the historical Christian family tree is all about and, and why I think it does resonate with me so much. So obviously, thank you to them. Uh, thank you to you for understanding the exercise here and continually being so grateful. And I've posted some videos lately where I'm asking, I think, really reasonable questions about given traditions and uh, everybody's just giving me the benefit of the doubt and talking like adults who get along, can have a laugh about some things and aren't so worried about everybody's fragile feelings. <laughs> we, can, we can just be candid with each other and still like each other. You're really, really good at that. And uh, obviously I always talk with other content creators and whatnot about 
you know, what their comment section is like, what the people who listen or watch their thing are like, and you're the best. It's not even close. You're the best. Everybody knows it, that there is something very special about the way you treat each other and very special about the fact that people so different as all of you are and as you are from me can hang out in the same room and think about something together and find benefit in it. And I just, I respect you and I really appreciate what you contribute to all of this just by merit of who you are and being here, whether you ever actually put fingers to keys and weigh in in the comment section or not. I really appreciate you. One last point of invitation that I want to offer. I do a daily podcast. Some of you know this already. It's called the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And on that daily audio only podcast, I am into, I guess, what we could call my second season. I just started. I did a massive season one, 800 daily, 10-ish minute episodes on the book of Matthew. That's completed. You can go back and start that from the beginning, move through it at your own pace. I'm so proud of it. I'd be really honored if you would check it out. If you haven't already, you can get that anywhere you get podcasts. There'll be a link in the description below. But I've just started my second season, and this one is different. It's a much shorter thing. It's only going to be 60-some episodes long, but I'm going through the whole Bible, one book per day until I'm done, and I'm, I'm reading the whole thing. I'm reading every book of the Bible two, three, four times in rapid-fire fashion because I have to get it done every day, and I just think it's been a blast and so humbling. I thought I knew this material so much better than I actually know the material. So, uh, wow. Yeah, I had a lot to learn. I still have a lot to learn. And I, I hope that really comes through in the daily show. I've gotten really kind feedback from those of you who are listening. So uh, I'd be grateful if you'd check it out if you haven't already. Uh, you can just scroll back into the most recent series to basically January 1st, January 2nd of 2023. And that's where you pick up with the series I'm talking about, the Through the Bible, um, one book per day thing that I've been doing. If you are listening, I'd always be grateful if you have a chance to write a review or invite a friend or something. I'd really like to have more people involved in that conversation too. Thanks again to Christ Church. Thanks again to you. Thanks again for considering being a part of the podcast thing as well. Look forward to doing this again uh, with some other churches in the very near future. All right. I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me on this YouTube channel. And let's do this again soon.